you know what? The shop basement goes for eight miles deep. This right here is where this wash stuff came down back into the crater, and you have these layers of material that came into the crater. Then you have something called the Chickahominy Formation. It's a marine unit that when everything quieted down, the muds and the sands covered everything up. And then the sea retreated, came back again, laid down another layer, and say the same thing again, and again, it's boring as a devil. Uh, if you went out and dug down about 10, 15 feet here, you'd hit the Yorktown, because it lies underneath that surficial layer here. Okay, so these are, these are formations that are formed during those high stands of sea level. Remember that? Okay. See, beautiful pictures we can draw with a little imagination. You've got your central peak. You have uh, a crater surrounding, we call it the boat. Then you have this annular trough, which here is not showing all the detail, but here's the detail that you see. Uh, you say, well, we don't worry about this. But you notice every one of those lines on there represents a fault. So what are you guys sitting on top of? Is it mush or fault? <laughs> Unstability. No. We are Virginians. We are conservative. We're solid rock. Okay? Anyway. Uh, the point we're trying to make is there's just all kinds of, of, uh, of faults, and, and they stair step down. You have a central wisdom crater. It's, it's a nice story. It, it, uh, Are those faults still shifting? Well, let's put it this way. This is my wife, Marilyn. I told her to ask this question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, she didn't. This is actually, may I say, an abortion of a diagram I drew uh, in a publication. See, this is the, the crater. That's the first two parts. This actually is a little further away. This one is out here. But you see, this reflects the idea that people who teach at little universities and students don't know any better, and they plotted it there. In fact, it's over here. All the earthquakes since 1884 are in the annular trough. We've had no earthquakes on the interior. So even the um, mineral one just a couple of years ago? Oh, you were the one mineral was? Back there. <laughs> yeah, it's on the Piedmont. And, and these, these are the coastal plain faults uh, 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 that create earthquakes. Okay? So there are four of them. But so that, that's a good indication there's still movement. So if you buy property, be careful. <laughs> another thing. <laughs> another thing is, if, if you if you drill a hole way over here in Charles City County or someplace, okay, you go down and guess what you find if you keep drilling? Fresh water. If you drill in Hampton, right there, you have salty water at depth. They, this, this goes into a little long story, but a guy named Cedarstrom in, in the late 40s was authorized by the federal government, the U.S. Geological Survey, to find sources of groundwater to supply all of the military installations in the Tidewater area. Well, this guy soon discovered that all the drillers knew that if you drill a deep hole down here, you're going to get salt water. This bothered him. Well, another thing that bothered him was when he drilled a hole, you remember those layers, those formations up here, the Eastover and all these layers? Well, shoot, if you take each one up and look at it, you're going to find certain microfossils that tell you which layer you're in. Okay? Well, Cedarstrom drilled down deeper. He sent his samples off to Cornell University, and Cornell says, you mixed up your samples because those deeper layers had those microfossils that said, oh, this is about 90 million years old. And in the same sample, you got something that's 38 million years old. And then you got something that's about 65 million years old. You mix your samples.
examples, and we're going to fire you from being Virginia Tech. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he almost got fired. Oh. The U.S. Geological Survey would not publish it. The, the, the description of the wells were actually published by what was called the Virginia Geological Survey. It's now the Division of Mineral Resources, okay? But <laughs> the guy was crazy, right? In the early 90s, these guys discovered the same thing, and then they said, oh, look at these peculiar things. Let's go borrow Texaco's seismic profiles and see if we've got some. And they discovered the Chesapeake Bay impact crater. Before that, it was unknown. So it's, it's, you know, it's like 20 years that we've learned about this thing. And that's a relatively new discovery. But this, this, this was a puzzle for a long time. How do you get higher salinity waters? Now, you guys don't believe me what they have when I say they're higher salinities. Well, here it is, guys. Ready? There, you know, here we are up at the uh, Williamsburg area. Uh, salinity is about 75 parts per million. Go a little further down toward the Newport thing, it goes to 100 parts per million. Got it? Get to Hampton, it's 1,000 parts per million. Why? Okay, guys, tell me why. You're all geologists now. <laughs> You're hydrogeologists. <laughs> huh? You're resigning. Okay. Well, then I, I, I'm going to ask you a question, okay? Let's go back to the top. Yeah, oh, yes, sir. Well, is it because the impact, when you had all, the, when it filled in and all, you don't, it's more porous now, so the ocean would be able to, to that, that, that's travel further in instead of where you would have uh, the harder bedrock and all further out. Yeah. See, these purple lines should normally, if you trace them up down the coast, just do this. And that reflects the fact that the oceans, these sediments were laid down in an ocean. And between the, the grains, there was salt water. But this is really hyper, by comparison. Now, I want you to go back at the impact moment. This object goes through the water, through the sediment, comes down into basement rock. What do we know about those rocks that it terminated in? Igneous. Igneous. What shape were they in? Taffy. Remember? Why were they taffy? Hot. Hot. That's heat, right. Heat and pressure. Now you've got a high, hot open hole, and what's going to come washing back in? Salt water. Salt water. What's going to happen to the water? Evaporates. What's going to leave behind? Salt. Salt. Man, you guys are good hydrogeologists. I love it. I mean, it took us years to discover this. You guys put one in the Okay. Anyway, this is, this, is, this is an explanation for it, okay? Now, what I want to go is I want to go to some younger stuff. Um, in a minute, but in the meantime, here's the earthquake. Uh, what's the highest number on the Richter scale? Uh, huh? Eight or nine. Ten. Yeah, ten. This is R10. This is a different system. So it's about a hundred times ten. So this is a magnificent earthquake. Uh, there are coastal fires, but interestingly enough, they're coastal fires, but they're put out by the blast. From the impact. This is uh, 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 Here's a note. We find no pieces of the impactor. It, what happens? Just think about it. Here's this object. It goes out of space at an incredible speed, say 100,000 miles an hour, passes through the atmosphere, that's nothing, goes through water, that's nothing, sediments, it feels, goes through really hard bedrock, all of a sudden the front end gets stopped. The back end did not get the message, <laughs> and so it's compressed. And when you compress an object, heat gets hot. It vaporized. We mm -hmm. just don't have any of it. It's really discouraging, okay? <laughs> but that happens. Uh, in any case, uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the impact created uh, another feature, this. It's called a tidal wave. And you remember tidal waves in the...